Hello geometry students, welcome to the chapter 11 review, extending volume. This is going to cover 11.1 to 11.4 in our textbook. So that's just those lessons. Uh, this review is covering those particular lessons. So let's jump right into it. Let's take a look at number one. Uh, assuming that this is a square, this cross section would be a square. If you couldn't make that assumption, then you could call that a, a rectangle. So I think either answer would be acceptable here. Uh, I think through at least one through four here, we're assuming all of these are uh, one through three are, are square bases. Uh, but if that assumption wasn't safe, you could say that or rectangle. So square or rectangle here. Uh, this cross section kind of coming in at a diagonal. Uh, you can see the the cross section right here that's made is a a triangle. So if this is like a block of cheese and you took a knife and sliced it on an angle like that, you would see this triangular portion exposed right there. So this is a triangle right there. Over here, this was the cross section that we were looking at. So this was a square shape right there. And then here on this one, we're looking at, let me get that a little bit better here. We're looking at, at that shape right there. And that would be a, a rectangle for sure right there. Not a square because it would be along the diagonal here of this, what appears to be a cube. So we'd have like 45, 45, 90, triangle right here, this hypotenuse is always going to be longer than these two legs. So a rectangle is the appropriate choice here. And then if this was a horizontal cross section, a perfect horizontal cross section, that would be a circle. But because this is going in at a diagonal, we would call that an ellipse. If you said an oval, I'd, I would probably take that. Um, but an ellipse, something to learn more about the, the technicalities behind it. Uh, later in your mathematical careers, so to speak, um, but an ellipse is the, the more appropriate choice here. Uh, so five, six, seven, all describing the three-dimensional shape that's generated by rotating each of these two-dimensional shapes around an axis as shown. So here's your axis for five, here it is for six, here it is for seven. With my uh, tablet here, I'm going to try to draw my best sketch of what would be happening if we rotated this around. So if we rotated this one, I'm trying to draw like all the different pieces here, what it would look like. Um, this is a little hard to do on this tablet, so my apologies that it isn't looking as good as it, it could. So I'm spinning this thing around. I'm trying to show you with these hidden lines what would be happening as you kind of whip that around or spin it around. If you've ever used a lathe or seen a lathe before, that's something that would spin wood around and you could use a chisel um, or uh, the different implements that you'd use with lathes. I don't think a chisel might not be the best thing to use with that, um, but they have special tools that can spin wood and turn it into uh, round balusters for stairs and, and stuff like that. Baseball bats are made that way. Um, but if you spin this half circle around, semi-circle around and spin around, you would end up getting a sphere. It would look like that. So number five should be a sphere. Number six, if you spin this around, there's going to be an opening right there. And then this part would spin around there and look, look like that. And then down here, you have the same sort of thing. This part would be hidden from view. And so would that part. And so you'd have this kind of opening or a hollow or open cylinder right there. So you could say a hollow cylinder or an open cylinder. Either of those, I think, would be a good description of that particular shape for number six. And then number seven, if you're spinning this around, go a little bit farther that way, sorry, and then end up looking like that, and you would have something that looks like, like this three-dimensionally, this triangle getting spun around here, and this would be a cone. Uh, so number seven should be a cone. Number eight, it's got three parts to it, so let's check out each part here. Describing the three-dimensional shape that's generated by rotating around the x-axis. So that's this axis right here. So I'm spinning this around, this rectangular shape. It's going to spin around, go down there, and come back up like that. And same thing over here. So you can see that should be a solid line right there. And you'd have a cylinder by rotating that around the x-axis. The length of the radius and the height of the figure generated. So the radius would just be from, from here to here. 
Looks like that's a difference of two right there. So the radius is two. No units included, so you could leave them off or say two units. And then the height of the, the cylinder would just be, what is it from here to here, connecting the two bases together. So it's negative four to positive four. That's a difference of eight. If you count that up, you count it that way as well. And then what's the volume? of the figure generated in terms of pi. So we're going to leave it in pi form. The volume formula for any prism or cylinder is just the area of the base times the height. More specifically for cylinders, it's pi r squared is always going to be what the area of the base is times the height. So we can just plug in what we got here and here into this formula. You've got pi times 2 squared times 8. We're leaving it in terms of pi. So we're not going to multiply pi through and approximate it. We've got two squared is four, four times eight is 32. So your final answer would be 32 pi. And you can leave units off or say units cubed since it is volume. There are no units given. So at least for, for my sake, uh, if I'm your teacher, this would be acceptable to, to just write nothing for units or to write units cubed. Moving on then to number nine, uh, finding the volume of each prism or cylinder. So we had that formula uh, as discussed in number eight. Volume is area of the base times the height. So for this one, I'm just going to write that right away. Same thing for number 10 because it's a prism. And then numbers 12 and 13, area of the base is pi r squared if it's a circular base as we have here for cylinders. And so same thing will happen here. And a pentagonal prism for this one. So that would be another b times h. So I've got all the formulas. Now I need to figure out what all the pieces are, put it all together, use what I know to find out what I don't. So I've got my base here is going to be the, I'm going to call it the top and the bottom with any rectangular prism. You can use left to right or front to back as well. Um, on this one though, I will have to use the triangles right there. Uh, so those are my congruent parallel faces connected by rectangular lateral faces. And then on these ones, the base is the circle. We'll just be using those formulas there. For, for 11, we'll get there in just a moment. But let's take a step back and focus on number 9 here. So the area of the base would be always length times width or base times height of the rectangle for a rectangular prism. So this would be little b times little h in terms of the, the base part, 18 times 16 for that. And then the height connecting the two bases is 8 right there. So if you take 18 times 16 times 8, we should get our answer here. So 18, and I've got a calculator handy. I would suggest that you are doing the same and just double checking my work as you go through this. Uh, I am checking my work against a pre-made key as well, so hopefully I won't be making any mistakes along the way here. But 2,304 centimeters cubed for the, the volume of that. For number 10, this is a one-half base times height situation because the triangles are bases for the, the capital B, for the area of the, the base in this particular case. So this is 5 right here. That's 13 means this is 13 from here to here. So I don't know this part. I'm going to call it x, and I'm going to solve for x in this one. So initially, I've got a little bit more work to do here. On, on that solve for x. So I've got x squared plus 5 squared equals 13 squared. x squared plus 25 then is going to be 169. Subtract 25 from both sides. And you've got x squared is 144. And then you can take the square root of both sides to get that x equals 12. And so x being equal to 12, that's the little b of the 1 half base times height for the triangle. So I'd have 12 for that, and then 5 for the, the height perpendicular to that base of the, the triangular prism's base. And so then from there, I've got my 1 half base times height. That's what B, capital B, is. And then the height of the prism itself is right here, 3, connecting the two triangular bases together. So times 3 looks like this would be half of 60. Just 30, 30 times 3 is 90. So we've got 90 meters cubed on this one. Number 11, a pentagonal or pentagonal, I suppose you could say either one. Uh, prism has a height of 10 inches 
and a base with a perimeter of 50 inches. Find the volume of the prism. So I'm going to try to draw a sketch of this one over here. Uh, we're going to assume... Well, let me draw the picture first, and then we'll, we'll draw some extra things on there. We're assuming the perimeter of this... So capital P for perimeter is 50 inches, and then the height of this pentagonal prism is 10 inches. So 10 inches going from, from there to there. And then we're going to need to figure out what's the area of the base. So I'm going to draw this in here like that. And so for, for that, to be able to do that, I would need to find the area of, of this little triangle there. So I'm going to take this red triangle here, draw a bigger picture of that down here to help us discover what the formula or what the, the values will be here that we need. Uh, so on this one, we are trying to figure out what's the area of the base to do that. The way I've taught it in the past, uh, or for, for this year here, uh, if you're one of my students, I was saying that was the area of one triangle, so the area of one of the base triangles, so like this one here, the, the bigger one, those two smaller ones put together. So area of one triangle times the number of triangles. So that's what capital B will be in this case. And then that times the height of the prism. The prism height is 10 on this one. So we need to figure out this information. If you prefer to use one half perimeter times apothem for what your, your base is, feel free to do that as well. So instead of writing what you see here, you could write one half PA if you like that better. Um, so on this one, this is my height of my triangle, which I could refer to as the apothem as well if you're using this idea or formula instead. So that's really all I need to know. I already know what this is going to be. Um, I got the perimeter. There's five sides, so the base length would be 50 divided by 5, which would be 10. So from here to here, that's going to be 10, meaning that this is 5 right there, and this is 5 right there as well. So I've got 5 right there. And I'm trying to find out what's this angle right here. This one would be 360 divided by 5, split in half. If I'm just dividing by 5, it's that whole angle right there. And then splitting that in half gives me just this one right there. And that will be 36 degrees. So then I just need to use some trig, excuse me, to figure that out. Um, and so we have, looks like opposite and adjacent that we care about. We don't really care about the hypotenuse on this one. So TOA of SOHCAHTOA, tangent of 36, is going to equal the opposite value, 5, over the adjacent value. I'll call it H here, but if you're doing the apothem way or this way, you could refer to that as A instead. Then I'll put that over 1. Consider cross-multiplying that from there. Uh, so I've got H times tangent of 36 would equal 5 times 1, which is just 5. And then I can divide both sides by the tangent of 36. That cancels out there then. And so H would be exactly that. H is 5 divided by the tangent of 36. I'm going to be plugging that into the formula. Uh, you could plug it in directly like that, or you could find it to several decimal places. I'm going to go with 5 decimal places or more to get the, the best possible answer I can here. So 5 divided by tangent of 36. Make sure your calculator is in degree mode and not radian mode. And it looks like we've got 6.88191 if I round that to five decimal places. So I'm going to use that as my height. You could also be calling that your apothem because that's the, the same thing here. So apothem is the same thing as height. Right here is that part. So now I can find the area of one triangle in this picture would be one half area of this particular triangle. Let me highlight that triangle that I'm talking about here. So I'm saying find the area of this triangle and then multiply that by five because there's five of those triangles that you can make in that uh, or in the base there. So let's take a look. Then we've got one half times the, the length of the base of that triangle would be 10 times the 
height of that triangle was this value. We found out the apothem. So 6.88191. So that's your one half base times height. That's the area of one triangle times the number of triangles that you can make like that, five. If you were doing this way, one half P times A, 10 times five is 50. So that's where the 50 comes from. And then the perimeter or the apothem rather was that. So you'd get the same thing doing it either way. And then from there, we'll put that into a calculator and let it do the work for us to, to wrap that up. Um, and so I'm actually going to just use the answer that I had from the previous thing I typed in my calculator. I'm using all the decimal places that way, but if you use at least five or more, you should get the same answer for sure, at least to the nearest tenth. So I'm getting 1,720.5, and units were inches on this one. We're talking about volume, so that is inches cubed for your answer there. Moving on to number 12, looks like this is a cylinder. It's just tilted a little bit, but it's still the same radius and height. This is your R right there, or the radius and height, same idea. This is a perpendicular height to this radius, so we're just plugging in these values directly, nothing to figure out initially before plugging things in. So we just have this. Uh, it doesn't say pi form or nearest tenth, so we can do either way. I'll show you both answers, what they would be. So it looks like 15 squared would be 225. And then you've got that times 23. So you'd have 5,175 pi millimeters cubed as an exact answer. If you multiply that by pi, use the pi button on your calculator, not 3.14. Uh, use all the decimals of the... Well, you can't use all the decimal places of pi because it's an irrational number and it has an infinite number of digits. Um, but use at least like 10 or whatever the calculator has stored for you and and do that. So 16,257.7 millimeters cubed to the nearest tenth. Pi form right there, decimal form right there. And on um, this last one on this particular page, um, we've got six as the, the diameter. So if we divide that by two for the radius, we'd have three here and three here. And the height, kind of an odd measurement to know the value of and not know this one, but that's what the picture looks like. So we know 10 across or cutting through the cylinder like that, we would be doing to find out what H is, six squared leg squared plus H squared, the other leg squared of this right triangle would equal hypotenuse squared, 10 squared. So we've got 36 plus H squared equals 100. Subtract 36 and then take the square root of both sides, h would equal eight. So we can take that. We know the radius right there is three, half of the diameter, and just plug those numbers in then. So we've got pi times three squared times eight, and we'll get pi form and approximate form. Three squared is nine, nine times eight, 72. So 72 pi, and that would be in yards cubed for volume. And 72 pi in a calculator, using the pi button, approximately 226.2, 226.2 yards cubed. So exact answer is above here in pi form, approximate answer in years tenth is right there. Looking now to the second page of our packet for this review, number 14, a pencil grip shaped like a triangular prism. So we can see that here with a cylinder removed from the middle. So there's been a hole drilled through there. The base of the prism is a right isosceles triangle with leg lengths of two centimeters. I'm going to label that as I go here. This is two and two right there. This would be two and two. The diameter of the base of the removed cylinder is one centimeter. So that's from here to here, that's one centimeter. From that point to that point, you could say the same thing up here. Uh, from that point to that point is one centimeter. That did not look like a C. Let me try that one more time here. One centimeter. That's not my best C down here either. So ugh. let me just erase that and make that look a little better. One centimeter 
it's a little better. Okay, so the diameter of that hole that's drilled out of there, uh, the heights of the prism and the cylinder are the same. They are the same, and they're both equal to four centimeters. So this is four there to, to there, either side. You could look at it as being four. What's the exact volume of the pencil grip? So the, the volume of the, the pencil grip, like how much material it would take to, to make this pencil grip, um, would be the volume of the right triangular prism minus, we're, we're drilling out or subtracting this area, or this volume rather, inside there. So minus the volume of the cylinder. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at a base times height situation for the right triangular prism minus the cylinder, also base times height, but base being pi r squared since it's a circle. And we just need to figure out what those values are to figure this out in the end. So we are, I'm going to draw a picture of this. Let me use purple for that. So I'm going to look at this particular triangle, draw a bigger version of it down here. Um, and let me draw it like this instead. So it's a right triangular prism. This is kind of a isometric perspective here. We are now looking at it. I'm trying to look at it straight down or straight from the bottom now instead. So we've got this right triangular prism. This was two. This was two. And if this is a right triangular prism, this is congruent to this. That means this angle is the same as that, meaning this is a 45 45 90 triangle so that um, could help me figure some stuff out here I don't even know if I need to know that but I don't don't think I do we've got this hole in the middle but you could call this n n n root 2 if you had to figure out the the perimeter of this for a surface area type problem you could be doing that but then this diameter all the way across is 1 that means the radius would be half of that 0.5 so the radius would be from the center of that to either that point or that point or any other rad radius as we look at that. Uh, so the right triangular prism's base, the, the area of the base would be one half, and I'm going to write it out in general here, base times the height of the little triangle. I'll use a, a lowercase t for that, and then that times the height of the prism. And then over here, we would have minus pi r squared times the height of the, the cylinder so I'll put a C there, but that's going to be the same as the height of the prism. So these are just little subscripts trying to remind me, okay, this height was not the same as this height. This value should not be the same as this value. So we're looking at one half base times height of the triangle for the base. So we'd have one half times two times two for that. The base and the height perpendicular to each other are two and two. And then that times the height of the prism is four. So we have that right there minus pi r squared, so minus pi, and then r is 0.5. We've got that here, half of, of 1, and then times the height of the cylinder matches the height of the prism. Uh, it is 4 right there. So if we are simplifying that, 1 half of 2 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 2 times 4 is 8. So the, the area of the right turning of the prism, or the volume, Sorry, volume of that would be 8. And then we are subtracting. This would be 0.25. If you multiply 0.5 times itself. And then that times 4 is just 1. So you have 1 pi. So you have 8 minus pi. That would be an exact answer. You could, if you're asked to give it in, in an exact form, you could write it like that. That's what it would be. And then if you are approximating that, we're getting about... 4.9 centimeters cubed. You can use a calculator to get there. So this would be an exact form. This would be an approximate form of that answer. Let's take a look at number 15, 16, and 17 now. Finding the volume of each pyramid or cone. So the formula for pyramids and cones is one-third area of the base times the height. So I'm going to write that on each one of these to start. The, these two appear to be square pyramids so that the bases well this one's actually a rectangular pyramid this base is not a square but this one is and then this one appears to be a triangular pyramid so we have the same formula 
but the work to get what capital B is might be a little bit different from problem to problem here. So we've got one third base area of the base times the height. That's going to be five times five times for the area of the base times the height is eight. So everything's directly given to me here. Pretty straightforward problem on this one. This would be 25. That times eight would be 200. And then that divided by, or multiplied by one third or divided by three could be written as 200 over three. That three doesn't go evenly into 200. So you could have that feet cubed. You could write that as a mixed number like that. Or you could uh, approximate that to the nearest tenth and get 0.7 feet cubed on that one. Um, so I would say either this, that would be an exact answer in a mixed number format, improper fraction format right there and then round it in the year's tenth right there. On this one, now we are given the slant height, it appears here. 14 is pointing to this right here. That is not the height. We need the, the height of the, the pyramid to be able to plug, or to, to get the, the right volume in the end. We need to plug that height in there. So the slant height is 14. So if I'm looking at this triangle, 14 is there. If this is 8, that would make this 4 from here to to here, and so your height can be calculated using the Pythagorean theorem there. We've got, and I'll do that work up here. So I'll write it pretty small. H squared plus four squared equals 14 squared. That'd be H squared plus 16 equals 196. So H squared subtract 16 from both sides, you'd have 180, and then take the square root. You've got H is the square root of 180. Because we are not asking you to get an exact form here, um, or like a simplified radical form, I'm just going to leave it like that and plug it in down there like that. So I've got one third times area of the base, 10 times 8 for a rectangular base like that, base times height, and then the height of the pyramid is the square root of 180. From there, if you had to get simplified radical form, you could split that up or find the biggest perfect square that divides evenly into there. I think it's 36, 36 times five. So that'd be six root five if you did do that work, if that was necessary. I'm saying it's not here though, based on the directions you weren't told you had to get that. So let's just find out what this is to the nearest 10th. We've got one third times 80 for 10 times eight times the square root of 180. And so just double checking what I had on a on the key that was done by another teacher. We're just comparing answers basically by doing this uh, 357.8 and I match up with what the other teacher had there. So inches cubed for the volume. And then moving on or looking at number 17 here. So on, on this one, uh, we are given that this is congruent to this. So if that's eight, this would also be eight. And I had to take a, a look there and look a little more closely at that. Notice right here, this is perpendicular to the base. So this 3D perspective is kind of hard to visualize on this one, what's going on. But this is actually your H in this case right here, be only because this is perpendicular to the base. If this wasn't perpendicular to this base right here, this would not be the height. We'd have to find something more like there to there. So this is not, I would call this an oblique pyramid. It's it's not perfectly straight up and down, although that perspective is kind of hard to, to see on this one. Uh, so if we are looking at this triangle right here, that is a small right triangle. I'm gonna to need to know the length from here to here. I'll do this in purple. So I'm gonna to need to know this purple length from here to here. And then I'm gonna take one half times base times height. So one half times the purple length times four, to figure out what the capital B is, the area of the, the base in this case. And then I'm gonna multiply that by 12, this perpendicular height to the base that goes from the base to the vertex of that pyramid. And so on this one, Looks like we would have one half times base times height. So I need to figure out that purple part. Uh, and to do that, I'm gonna have to figure out this value first. So that's X 
And then if this is a isosceles triangle that's perpendicular, this would also be x here. So two x's would make up what the length of the base is, what the purple part is going to be. So we've got x squared plus 4 squared. That's this value right here is pointing to that length right there. So x squared plus 4 squared, right triangle right here, would be hypotenuse squared, 8 squared. So x squared plus 16 equals 64. Subtract 16, and you're left with 48. And then take the square root of both sides. And you're left with, let me get rid of this square root. You're left with x is equal to the square root of 48. So that means the base would be double that. So the base is going to be 2 times the square root of 48. We could get simplified radical form on this one as well. This would be 16 times 3 on the inside. If you did a factor tree, that would be fine to do it that way too. So the 16 would come out as a 4. So all of this all together would be 8 root 3. Uh, I'm not showing the work, but I verbalized the work there. You don't need to show the work in this problem because you're not asked to, to show all the simplified radical form work. You could go right to saying this is approximately 8 times oops, 8 times the square root of 3, approximately 13.856. Four one to the nearest hundred thousandth. Um, so I'm going to take that and plug it in up here. I've got one half base times height for this capital B. So one half and then 13.85641. And then that times the height of that triangular base right here was four. And then that times the height of the pyramid perpendicular, a length perpendicular to the the base there of the pyramid is 12. So I'm going to take that then, plug that into a calculator, and compare my answer with the other teacher's key and see if we've got the same thing here. So one half, or one third times one half times that, 13.8 and some change number times four, and then times 12. And so on this one, looks like the, the key, handwritten key I'm looking at has 110.8, um, but I kept the decimals five digits or more, and I, I used that. So I got 0.85, which would round off to 0.9. So I'm going to go with that as the best answer, 110.9 centimeters cubed. So if you're one of my students, I'm requiring you to use five or more decimal places. I think the, the 0.8 issue compared to my point 0.9 here came from not using as many decimal places as I used here. So this would be the best answer I think you could get rounded off to the nearest tenth. Let's take a look then at number numbers 18, 19, and 20. Looks like we have two cones here and then like a half a cone on that one. So we are looking at finding the volume of these here. The volume would just be one-third base times height, same as idea as a pyramid, uh, but base always being a circle, so base area is always pi r squared. We're going to use that as our shortcut formula. On this one, it's only half of what you normally would have, so it's one half times one third pi r squared h. And then on this one, back to a whole, <coughs> excuse me, whole cone, one third pi r squared h. So we are looking at one third times pi times, and then on this one, if you have 14 there, your radius would be seven for that, just dividing that by two. And so radius would be seven. So you have seven squared, and then on this one, if that's seven, this is 25, we're assuming that's 25, then let's call this x, and we would have x squared plus seven squared equals 25 squared x squared plus 49 would equal 625. Subtract 49, you're left with 576. Take the square root of both sides, and you're left with 24. So x is 24. That is equal to the, the height. So the, the height is connecting vertex or yeah, vertex to the, the base in a perpendicular way, which is what we have there. So this would be 24 for your height. And you multiply this out, and let's see what we've got. One-third of... 24 is 8, and then this would be 8 times 7 squared is 49. So 8 times 49 
ends up being 392 pi. So an exact answer would be that yards cubed. And then if we were to round that off, multiply 392 times pi, 1,231.5. 1,231.5 yards cubed. So rounded off answer, yards cubed there, and then exact answer right there. For this one, we have one half times one third. You could go right to saying that's one sixth. And then we've got pi times radius is 12 directly given to us there. And then the height directly given to us here, assuming that's referring to the height as 25. Uh, looks like it, yes. So we have that times 25. And then this is going to be 144, uh, 1 one sixth of 144 is 24. And then 24 times 25 is 600. So we've got 600 pi on this one. As an exact answer, this would be meters cubed. Round that off. 600 times pi is approximately 1,884.9555. So if we go to the nearest tenth, that's going to bump up that to 1,185.0 to the nearest tenth. So that many meters cubed on this one. Pi form up there, exact form, and then approximate form down there. Then on number 20, we've got one third pi times, the radius in this case is an unknown quantity, but it looks like I can use some, some basic trig to figure that out. So I'm gonna do this in red here, the trig stuff. So we've got R as the radius, we've got H is my, my height. So I know that, I just need to figure out R. And in this case, I've got opposite and adjacent that I'm trying to figure out. I know opposite, I'm trying to figure out adjacent. I don't really care about the hypotenuse. So TOA of SOHCAHTOA, again, using tangent on this one as we did on page one, I think, for one of the problems there. Um, we had tangent here, opposite over adjacent. So 18 over R. So if I take that, I can think of that as being over one and cross multiply that. Tangent of 66 is just a, a decimal that I can get using my calculator. So tangent of 66 times R would equal 18 times one, 18. And then from there, you can divide by tangent 66. That would cancel out there. Again, make sure you're in degree mode, not radian mode when you type this in, so tangent 66, 18 divided by tangent of 66 is going to give me 8.01412 to five decimal places. So I'm gonna take that, plug it in right there. You could type it in just like that. You put 18 divided by tangent of 66 in parentheses and square it. That would give you the best possible answer there. Um, but if you're going to round and you're one of my students, use at least five or more decimal places. So that squared and then times the height is 18 right there. So then I'm going to take that, put it in a calculator, and let's see. <coughs> Excuse me, see what we get for that. So I'm going to, I'm just going to go right to the decimal approximation, pi included in there since I have already rounded off this radius. So I've got one third times pi, typing this into the calculator, I would suggest you do the same and you're getting this practice with um, the calculator, getting you ready for the, the test. So we take that and we square it, and multiply that by 18, and it looks like we've got matching answers against what I have here on the handwritten key from another teacher. We've got 1210.6 millimeters cubed on this one. And that's page two. We've got one more page to look at here on this review. So in 21, we're finding the volume of this. And then this cone that you notice the center does not match up directly straight up and down with the vertex. So that's a kind of on a slant or we the fancier name for that that we're looking for here is the oblique cone. The formula for oblique pyramids, oblique cones, Oblique cylinders, oblique prisms for that matter, for volume is the same as the formula for 
your standard striping down right cones, right pyramids, cylinders, etc. So the formula isn't going to change. It's still one third base, which is pi r squared in a cones case times the height. So we've got one third pi times the radius is six. So times six squared times the height is 12. So everything's directly given to me here. The, the sneaky part about this problem was just knowing the formula is the same. So we've got 36 for six squared. And then one third of that would be 12. 12 times 12 would be 144. So an exact answer would be 144 pi centimeters cubed. Round that puppy off and you have 144 pi is 452.4 approximately. So 452.4 centimeters cubed. So exact pi form right there, approximate form right there. Uh, finding now the surface area and volume of spheres, we're going to be looking at spheres for the, the rest of this review here. So the surface area formula was 4 pi r squared, essentially 4 circles, and then the volume formula was, and I'll do, I'll, I'll do this in purple for volume, 4 thirds pi r cubed. Um, so if we look at this, the radius directly being given to us makes this a very straightforward problem. We've got 4 pi times 7 squared. That's going to be 49. 49 times 4 is 196. So you've got 196 pi, and that would be in inches squared now because this is an area, surface area. So that's an exact form, and then you can approximate that, approximate form, 196 pi is 615.8 approximately. So 615.8 inches squared to the nearest tenth. And the volume, 4 thirds pi times 7 cubed. 7 cubed, I think it's 343. Yep, I just double check that with my calculator, and then I'm going to multiply that before, divide that by 3. It's not an exact value, so uh, this would be 1372 over 3 pi inches cubed. That'd be an exact answer. Uh, you could write this as 457 and one third pi inches cubed, but for the purposes of the test, you probably wouldn't have to do either of those. Just get the, the decimal approximation. But just in case you did have to, that's how you do that. Uh, so we're going to take that times pi and getting approximately 1,436.8. 1,436.8 inches cubed on that one. So exact form, approximate form. Uh, on this one, it looks like 89 is the diameter. So if you divide that by 2, we would get our value right there. 89 divided by 2. Then it being 44.5 for the radius. So the radius is 44.5 feet on this one. So going directly to our formula, then from there we can replace R with 44.5. Square it. So 44.5 squared. That times 4 would be exactly 7,921 pi, since the pi is still there. And so we'd have feet squared for it being a surface area. And multiply that by pi, round that off approximately 24,884.6 feet squared to the nearest tenth. And then volume, I'll continue to use purple for these last couple here. So do that, 4 thirds pi r cubed would become 4 thirds pi times 44.5 cubed. So 44.5 to the third power, 88,121.125. If I multiplied that by 4 and divided that by 3, um, it looks like that gives me, I'll, I'll give you the, what the exact value is here in a mixed number format. 117,494. And then 0.83333, 3 is repeating, uh, that ends up being 5 sixths to the, uh, in a reduced 
fraction format. So we have that times pi uh, feet cubed for volume. Very unlikely that you'd have to get it like that. You probably could just go right from here to the approximate form. But just showing you both just in case you're wondering or need to, to do that. Um, so if I take that value, multiply it by pi, round that off, I've got 369,120.9 feet cubed. And then number 24 is a hemisphere. So surface area, if you're one of my students in my prior notes or if you've been watching the prior notes, there's a shortcut formula you could go right to if you wanted to. Surface area, it's going to be half of what it normally is, but then you've got this extra circle showing up here, this great circle we call that, that wasn't showing up before. The radius is still going to be half of that right there, so I'll do that while I'm thinking about it. The radius is 32 divided by 2, which is 16 meters. Um, but we've got 4 pi r cubed for this part down here times 1 half, and then 4 pi r squared, sorry, times 1 half, and then an extra pi r squared here for that. So we have to do plus pi r squared because that's showing. So if you want to use the shortcut formula that I had taught you before of 3 pi r squared, you're welcome to do that. So 3 pi r squared can be our shortcut formula here. So we've got 3 times pi times 16 squared. That ends up being uh, 16 squared is 256, and then 256 times 3 is 768. So I've got 768 pi. This would be in meters squared. Rounding that off to the nearest tenth. Uh, we've got, sorry, I just hit pi. <laughs> pi is 3.14. Uh, I want three. I want 768 times pi. So 2,412.7 is my nearest tenth answer there. So that 0.7 meters squared. So that is rounded off approximate form. This is exact form, pi form right there. And then volume, this is a half of a sphere. The volume would just be half as much. There's no extra part showing uh, like there is with surface area, or no extra part that would be held volume-wise by a hemisphere um, that's not clear from from that. I'm not saying that very well, but there's no extra part like there is here with the pi r squared. So four-thirds pi r cubed gets multiplied by one-half, or taking half of what the volume normally is. So one-half times four-thirds pi r cubed. So you can go right to the shortcut formula of this would reduce down, or half of four-thirds would be two-thirds. So you'd have two-thirds pi r cubed. Replacing r with 16, and then cubing 16 gives you 4,096. That times 2, and then divided by 3 gives you, this would be an exact, simplified, reduced, or reduced mixed fraction answer. 27.30 and two-thirds pi meters cubed for volume. Uh, more likely you could go right from this step to this step though and not worry about that step. Uh, this would be 8,578.6 rounded off meters cubed. So exact or pi form in a mixed number format there and then round it off nearest tenth form. And it looks like we're almost there. These are the last four problems on this review and we'll be all, all set with this. So find the volume of a hemisphere with a radius of its great circle equal to, to eight yards. So I'm going to use the shortcut formula that I had derived right here. It's one half of four thirds pi r cubed. So I'm just going to go straight to two thirds pi r cubed. And on this one, if we're, we're looking at a hemisphere, I'll draw a quick picture of this. So we've got something that looks like this, and the radius of the great circle is 8. That means the radius of the sphere, the hemisphere, is also 8. So we can just replace r with 8 cubit, multiply it by 2 thirds. So 8 to the, the third, 5 12, and multiplying that by 2 divided by 3 gives us an exact mixed number form of that, 
343 and a third pi. Uh, this would be yards. Yards, we're talking volume, so yards cubed. And if I multiply that by pi and get this rounded to the nearest tenth, 1072.3 to the nearest tenth. So 1072.3 yards cubed. Now find the volume of a, I don't know what that, is that misspelled, <laughs> the I-N? I'm not sure why the program did that earlier, but find the volume of a sphere whose area of a great circle, I suppose that should be in there, so of a great circle is approximately that. So the area of this great circle, and this is a whole sphere, not a hemisphere on this one, so let me draw a, a picture to try to quickly represent that. Um, so we know the, the area of this great circle Right here, the great circle being this part containing the radius there is 28.6 inches squared. So if the area of that is that, I can take this formula, pi r squared, define the radius, replace 28.6, or put that in place of, of a, and then solve for r from there. So I could divide by pi, and I have 28.6, divided by pi is r squared, then I can take the square root of both sides, square root and square root canceled there, r is, I'm going to leave it like that for now, 28.6 divided by pi. I could get that as a decimal approximation, if you're one of my students, I'd want you to use at least five or more there, since we're not done with the problem yet. So we've got volume, would be four-thirds pi r cubed, and I'm replacing, I can extend my arrow a little bit farther here, sorry, that I'm going to put in right there and let the calculator do the work for you here. This one will definitely go right to the rounded off nearest tenth answer. Uh, we'd have 28.6 divided by pi and we're going to cube that. So typing this in the calculator is probably the hardest part of this problem. Just making sure you're doing that in a proper way. Uh, we've got four thirds times pi and then I'm going to put in parentheses the square root of 28.6 divided by pi, all that being under the square root, then I'm going to close the parentheses and raise that to the third power. And it looks like I get 115.1 in the end. So approximately 115.1. And I hope you do this with all problems that you're thinking, is that a reasonable answer? And like this area of the great circle was 28.6, but then you got an answer in like the hundred thousands or millions. That just seems a little big, a little astronomical to me there. Uh, so just make sure you're, you're thinking, does this answer make sense with any question you're ever doing in math? Um, that seems like a reasonable answer there to me. If that was true to start, the volume would be 115.1 in this case. All right, number 27, find the surface area. <coughs> Excuse me of a hemisphere again. So we're going to essentially be thinking about a, a bowl here. And the diameter of its great circle is equal to 48. So this is 48 yards. That means the radius would be that divided by 2. 48 divided by 2 is 24. So you have 24 yards for your radius. The surface area shortcut, if you go back to number 24, we talked about this formula getting to 3 pi r squared. It's half of what it normally is, half of 4 pi r squared, plus the extra great circle that you can see when you are looking at a hemisphere. So the, the shortcut is 3 pi r squared, which I'll just go straight to on this one. So I've got 3 pi times 24 squared. 24 squared, 576. And then 24 squared, 576 times 3, we've got 1728. And so we have 1728 pi on this one. That would be in yards squared, since we're talking about area. If you round that off, multiply that by pi, you end up getting 5,428.7. So 5,428.7 yards squared as your rounded off answer. So exact answer up here, rounded off answer down there, pi form versus approximate. The circumference finally of a great circle 
is approximately 26 meters. Find the surface area of the sphere. So on this one we have a sphere. Split up the, the work there. And the circumference in this case of that great circle, so the radius would be there, but the circumference is 2 pi r is the formula. The circumference is 26. So we've got, I meant to just write c equals 26 here, and then we'll get to the formula down here. So circumference is 2 pi r, and I'm replacing circumference with c with 26. So I've got 26 equals 2 pi r. I could divide by 2, and I'd have 13 equals pi r, and I could divide by pi and get my radius is 13 divided by pi. So I'm gonna leave it exact like that for now, 13 divided by pi, and I'll take that and plug it into my formula up here. So surface area of a sphere is three pi r squared, just like we discussed for 27 and going back to 24, that's where that came from. Half of a normal hemisphere, or half of a normal sphere, plus the extra great circle that you can now see. So we were just taking three times pi times 13 over pi squared. And so on this one, if you if you were to take 13 squared, that's 169 times, um, times three, it would be 507 on the top. And we'd have this pi as well. So 507 pi on the top. I'm gonna think of this as being over one. Uh, and then on the bottom, you would have 1 times pi squared. You take the square and kind of distribute it, in a sense, to both the top and the bottom, both the numerator and denominator. So you do this divided by pi squared, and you'd end up having... Um, oh, sorry, my phone just started going off there. Uh, so you'd have 507 divided by pi squared... 507 pi divided by pi squared. The pi here would cancel with one of the pi's here. So this would be an exact answer, kind of a strange answer. Doubtful you'd have to have this pi form sort of answer here. Um, but this would be that many meters squared for surface area. Put this into a calculator, 507 divided by pi ends up being... <coughs> Yeah, I, I think the, uh, can I blame the phone throwing me off? No, what am I doing wrong here? This whole problem, that should not be a three. It's a just a sphere, it's not a hemisphere. So let me backtrack, retrace my steps there. There I go again. So if you are like me at all, start thinking about something else when you're getting close to being done with something <coughs> or something distracts you like my phone did, I'm gonna just blame that, that's my excuse. Um, <laughs> Screwed up on that one, sorry about that. So I've got four times 13 squared, and that'd be 676, so here we are, 676 pi on the top over pi squared, and that pi would cancel with one of the pi's. So this would be an exact pi form answer. 676 divided by pi, <coughs> is your approximate answer. So that would be meters squared right here, surface area, and then 215.2 meters, 215.2 meters squared for your sphere, not hemisphere, surface area. Sorry about that. So we disregard what I was saying there. Hopefully you caught that and you're saying, Wagner, what are you doing? What are you doing? And thankfully I caught my mistake before I stop the video. Uh, so 215.2, final answer there. Ah, all right, chapter 11 review, all set with that, one through 28. Feel free to go back, rewind, fast forward, etc., to help you with any of these problems. If you're one of my students, uh, send me an email and I'll, I'd be happy to, to connect with you to help you out if you're still having trouble with any of these problems. If you're not one of my my students in class, but you're one of my students on YouTube, feel free to comment and I'll try to get back to you when I have the time to do so. Hope you have a great day. Hope to see you later on here, uh, checking out some more problems, learning some more about the universal language that is known as mathematics. Bye-bye.